Welcome everyone to How to Think Like Shakespeare with Scott Newstock. My name is Taryn Edwards and I am one of the librarians here at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. And this event was produced in collaboration with the San Francisco Writers Conference. Together we provide high quality or we aim to provide high quality learning experiences for writers at low cost or free. And I'd like to thank those of you who elected to support this event and pay a little something to attend because especially now it goes a long way to help us do more in these especially challenging times. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Mechanics Institute, we are an independent membership organization that houses a wonderful library that oldest, the oldest in fact designed to serve the general public in California. We're also a cultural event center and a world renowned chess club that is the oldest in the nation. Right now, due to the shelter in place, almost all of our activities are virtual, but I encourage you to consider becoming a member with us. It's only $120 a year. And with that, you help support our contribution to the literary and cultural world of the San Francisco Bay Area. Oh, I just wanna make a comment to Michael. I see your comment about closed captioning and I'll fix that shortly. Um, so our speaker today is Scott Newstock, who's a professor of English and founding director of the Pierce Shakespeare Endowment at Rhodes College. Um, he's also a parent and award-winning teacher and the author of Quoting Death in Early Modern England, as well as being the editor of several other books. He resides in Memphis, Tennessee, and I'm going to put his, you, his website uh, in the chat space. Um, before we get started, I just want to encourage our guests to use the chat space because that is how I'm going to pose questions to Scott. Um, and we will get to those at the end of his talk. Um, are we ready? Scott? <laughs> I'm ready. Perfect. Um, so why don't you go ahead and I'm going to mute myself. Good. Well, thank you, Taryn. It's really great to be in conversation with the Mechanics Institute today. Uh, one thing that I, I love about learning about the Mechanics Institute is how much it accords with the spirit of my book. Um, if you look at the foreword to the history of the Mechanics Institute by Kevin Starr, the former California State Librarian, he focuses on that 19th century of mechanic uh, in the Walt Whitman sense as being a skilled maker of things, a, an artisan, a fabricator, a master of techne. And that's exactly the kind of spirit that animates my book, How to Think Like Shakespeare. Um, I think the Whitman that he's pointing to is probably from I Hear America Singing. Uh, I hear America singing, the varied carols I hear, those of mechanics, each one singing his as it should be blithe and strong, carpenters, masons, boatmen, deckhands, shoemakers, woodcutters, plowboys, each singing, what belongs to him and her and to no one else. And that's that I think is exactly in the spirit of um, Shakespeare and Shakespeare's thinking about mechanics. You might recall that in the play, A Midsummer Night's Dream, we have a number of artisans, uh, a, a bellows mender, a weaver, a tinker, the, the group of people, those actors who Puck dismissively calls rude mechanicals, but I actually think that Shakespeare is very fond of, the, of these figures, these artisans, these makers, these mechanics. And in fact, I think he probably thought of himself as a maker in that, in that same way as the Whitman sense of what it means to be a mechanic. Now, I'm, I'm, as I was telling Taryn right before we started, my semester just started yesterday and my students often make a mistake in their first papers when they're talking about Shakespeare and spelling his profession, they spell it playwright, W-R-I-T-E. Now that makes sense because it, that's what a writer does presumably is that they write. But what's fascinating is that the correct spelling is W-R-I-G-H-T. And that comes from an old English root meaning to make or to forge or to fabricate or craft something. So a playwright is someone who crafts plays just like a boatwright is someone who builds boats or a candle right is someone who makes candles, or a wheelwright is a person who makes wheels. A, a playwright is someone who makes plays. 
so I think the more you can think about the process of being a playwright and as a maker, as a, as a creator, the, the more helpful it is for approaching Shakespeare and then also helping our own creation and our own making and our own lives. Now, obviously, as Emerson pointed out, Shakespeare will never be made by the study of Shakespeare. And I'm not saying that just by looking at this book, you're going to figure out how to write how to write like Shakespeare. But I do think that if you can work your way into the kind of puzzle of Shakespeare's own intellectual formation, his own education, you can start to recognize some maybe cognitive habits or practices or strategies that you can use for refining your own writing and speaking and thinking. So what I'll do today is just give a very quick survey of my book, which is divided into 14 uh, brief chapters. And um, I'll give you a couple of examples along the way of the kinds of practices or the kinds of exercises that Shakespeare would have undergone in his own education as well as in his career and how those can apply to us still today. So the book opens with the chapter on thinking and it, it talks about how, how difficult it is to describe thinking and how difficult it is to depict thinking and how we struggle in different ways to, to imagine what thinking looks like. I find fascinating that when Shakespeare describes thinking, one consistent thing that he does is he turns to the language of craft. So he, he makes an, an analog between uh, the, the work in the workshop of making things and the craft of thought. So for instance, he speaks of thoughts world like a potter's wheel, or he has a character talk about the quick forge and working house of thought and a number of characters describe the process of thinking as something like hammering thoughts as if they were in a blacksmith shop. He even invents a word for thinking, forgative, which looks like that word should come from the same root as forget, but actually comes from the root for forge, again, to craft or to make something. So in his work, he tends to turn towards that language of craft when attempting to describe the complexity of, of thinking. In the second chapter, I talk about the ends of education and how dangerous it is when we turn means into ends or, or means overtake ends. So it, in particular, I think it's unhelpful in education to focus too much on testing, too much on assessment. I feel like that ends up contorting the learning process and, and kind of evacuates the joy out of learning itself. So I what's the opposite of something like assessment or what's a counter narrative to, to that, that quantitative narrow sense of learning as assessment. In the third chapter, I suggest that it is craft. It's the language of craft that is most helpful as a way to articulate learning in any tradition and learning about anything. So whether that's making a vase or that is making a play or learning mathematics, those are all better described as crafts. They're handed down between generations. They involve ongoing tradition, but tradition that's revised. They are developed within a community and they are things that you can refine in collaboration with others. That to me describes all of what I love about education in, in my, my own time as a student, as well as my time as a teacher. And I think it applies to, to multiple realms when you, when you do think about thinking and education. As you might know, Shakespeare himself grew up in a craft workshop. His father made gloves. And one of the things you need to do as an artisan is think about fit, um, literally fit with making gloves that would fit the customer's hands, but also more generally fit or congruence between the thing that you're making and the market or audience that you're seeking. And I think that's crucial to thinking and, and, and education as well, a kind of congru congruence between the task at hand, the materials you have, the community with which you're, you're working. That relates to the physical aspect of education about being in the same place at the same time. Obviously the global pandemic of the last year and a half has forced all of us to scramble to improvise with not being in the same place at the same time. And, it's allowed things like this conversation to take place from afar across the globe. That having been said, I think there's been a great loss in terms of not being in the same room at the same time with the group of people. I think there, there are all kinds of things that are very difficult to replicate online in the, in the kind of dynamic give and take that we love about education. So this is a satirical postcard from 
the early 20th century of a, an artist making fun of, of a fantastic idea of what education will be like in the future. You see the teacher on the side there shoving books into a hopper and then the, a student assistant is grinding them up and then they're being electronically or digitally zapped into the students' heads. So they're in the same room, but they're not really in the same place, are they? They're not really co-present to one another. They're not, they're not thinking alongside one another. And I, I, I love the dynamic of thinking alongside other human beings in a room together. The forum that we're in right now allows me to speak unidirectionally and you to pose the questions in the chat, but it's not quite the same thing as me reading your body language and some of you whispering to each other and someone getting visibly irritated and getting into a heated discussion. Um, that's just really something that I think is precious that uh, is, is not rep replicable in this forum. Something that people have talked about is crucial to education and crucial to thinking since the beginning of thinking about education is practices of attention, how we are easily distractible. It's a very human thing to be distractible and, and the kinds of habits we need to inculcate in order to focus our attention, whether that's attending a performance of a play together or reading a text together slowly and puzzling out over its words. That's long been a, a crucial aspect of, of how, we, how we learn together. Uh, the middle of the book has a short chapter on technology. And the, the main thing that I'm trying to convey in that chapter is simply that I think it's mistaken to limit technology to only digital technology. Uh, that's a kind of conflation that we make in our world today. When we talk about technology, we always think it's a the computer or it's the internet or it's our phones or it's, it's something digital or it's something electronic. But in fact, technology comes from that root techne as, as the, um, the founders of the Mechanics Institute knew. And, and techne relates to being an artisan or a craftsperson in, in, in all kinds of wonderful ways. So for example, a book is a technology. It's a, it's a, a thing that can be used and can be used in all, all wonderfully different kinds of ways, but it's, it's a viable technology and it remains a viable technology to this day. Writing on a piece of paper is a technology, an incredibly powerful technology that's lasted for millennia. Um, so the, the, main, the main suggestion of that chapter is just to remind us to think of that fully expansive sense of what technology is and not to be narrowly limited to the most recent iteration of digital technology. Ever since Aristotle, philosophers have talked about the, the human dynamics of imitation and how we learn from one another and developmentally how we learn to become fully autonomous human beings through the process of imitation. And 16th century educational theorists knew this and they applied it in all kinds of wonderful ways. So here's a great example of an application of imitation in order to prove your writing. It's something that writers do to this day. It was a practice called double translation. And the, the principle was articulated in England by a schoolmaster named Roger Ascham, who was also the early tutor to Queen, the later Queen Elizabeth. So this is, this is Ascham's uh, exercise that's de designed around the practice of, of imitation or double translation. Here's, here is what Ashum um, suggests here in the schoolmaster. The child must take a book and sitting in some place where no one's prompting that child, the child needs to sit by theirself, um, let the child translate into English a lesson, a source from Latin, um, Cicero, for example. Then the child takes the English version of the Latin shows it to the teacher and lets the teacher take away from the child the Latin source, take a break for an hour at least, and then let the child translate that English translation back into Latin in another book, a, a fresh blank page. And the child brings that double turned Latin or that double translated Latin, and then the teacher compares the original, in this case, it's Cicero, and the child's double translated Latin. So it's created a circuit across the, the language translation. It's the double translation where you're now comparing Latin to Latin and you're seeing how far away you are from that. So if you've, ever, if you've ever messed around with Google Translate, you know how garbled that can come back when you go through that process. Or if you've ever attempted to um, imitate another writer with, uh, in another language, you know how difficult that is. 
but it also teaches you about how to emulate someone else's voice. And inadvertently, it teaches you how to be a better writer in your own language because you're, you're paying so much careful local attention to the process of articulation of, of another writer that you inadvertently become a, a master of your own writing. So here's a kind of flow chart quickly of what Ashton was recommending. You take a Latin source, you translate it to English, you take a pause for an hour, then you take the English source, you translate it back into Latin, and then you compare that original Latin to the double translated Latin. And this is something I was just talking to um, a translator that I know, Tess Lewis, that's recommended in translation exercises today to see how, how, how close you can get back to that original through that process. So that's a very strict form of imitation, but the goal is to become fluent in your own um, articulation of yourself. And it's something that later writers have recommended as well. Benjamin Franklin famously was frustrated as a teenager by his own lack of eloquence, in part because his brother had pulled them out of school to work in a print shop. So Franklin would read an essay from the 18th century periodical, The Spectator, put it aside, try to reconstruct that essay from memory, and then he would compare his reconstructed version with the original. And that's that's an English to English translation, as it were, but it really helped him become a better writer by imitating a good model. And this is actually something that contemporary um, computer programmers recommend as well, is take a good model, examine it, take notes on how it works, try to rewrite the program independently on your own, and then go back and compare it to the original program that you admired in the first place. So it's just a, it's just a, again, a basic fact that humans are imitative animals. You might as take, it might as well take advantage of that and, and use it to your own benefit to, to imitate good models and then become a better autonomous person on your own ultimately. Um, there were a wonderful series of exercises in Shakespeare's youthful classroom that helped him and his whole cohort, his whole generation of writers, uh, his appears to become better writers. This is probably the most famous one. Um, it's, it's a practice called copia, and it was first articulated by the great Dutch humanist uh, Desiderius Erasmus in the beginning of the 16th century, and it was practiced uh, all the way through the 18th century. Copy is a Latin word that gives us, our ob obviously gives us the English word copy, like a photocopy, but it also gives us that word copiousness, like a cornucopia or profusion. So one of the things that Erasmus recommended was to think about how many different ways you could say the same thing. So this is kind of the opposite of imitation. Ashton was recommending, how can you exactly imitate another writer in order to become a better writer yourself. Erasmus is saying, how can you say the same thing in, in as many different ways as you can possibly imagine? So kind of as a stunt, as a rhetorical stunt, Erasmus says, let's take just one example of an everyday phrase, your letter pleased me greatly. So an analog today might be, thanks for your email. Uh, totally everyday, totally ordinary statement, boring. Of course, there's no way you could say that any better. That's just what it is. Your letter pleased me greatly. And then Erasmus goes through a series of variations where he'll either replace a, a subject with another word, or he'll invert the word order, or he'll think of a synonym for the verb, or he'll find another way to rearrange the sentence. And he just goes on and on and on and on. I was in no small measure refreshed in spirit by your grace's hand. From your affectionate letter, I received unbelievable pleasure. Your affectionate letter brought me unbelievable pleasure. Your pages, pages engendered in me an unfamiliar delight. Your lines conveyed to me the greatest joy. The greatest joy was brought to me by your lines. And another 125 more variations beyond that. So my, my students tend to chuckle when they look at this, but but the point is Erasmus is urging you to think about all of the verbal resources that you have to hand to articulate your thought. And the premise being that the more you, the more you force yourself to be clear, the more you're also forcing yourself to clarify your thinking and express it in the most direct and accurate way possible. So this is exhausting obviously, but it is, it is a good practice for helping yourself to become more articulate and more clear about what it is you're trying to convey to your reader. And Erasmus's point is that the goal of imitation and the goal of exercises like this is not to sound like another writer. In fact, trying to sound exactly like them is, is often the worst thing you could do. What you really wanna to do to sound like Cicero is to write in the Ciceronian spirit. 
um, what you really want to do is to, to aim for their higher virtues and not just their local virtues of their thinking and their writing. Shakespeare's education, um, highly valued conversation, debate, uh, staging voices in conversation with another, imagining yourself in other subject positions that are not like your own subject position. It also valued um, the, the principle of stock or kind of gathering an inventory of knowledge so you could create new knowledge. And in fact, this is that word inventory is related to a keyword um, in the history of rhetoric. You might have heard statements like this online that say, uh, Shakespeare invented 1700 words. And then someone will rebut that and they'll say, no, actually Shakespeare did not invent 1700 words. But they're both kind of playing off of the wrong notion of what it means to invent a word. Um, the, this word inventio, this Latin term was known as the kind of the process of discovering the best available means of persuasion. So the premise here is that in order to invent something, you first have to have an inventory. You first have to know something. Uh, you, you have to have built up a base of knowledge so that you can create something new. And scientists often confirm this, that they, they didn't create something from nothing. When they made an invention, they were, they were gathering together things that, that existed before them in a new configuration. Uh, that sense of invention coming out of the inventory of your already existing knowledge or your stock of knowledge. So here's just one example from, from Shakespeare. Uh, from Macbeth. This is guilty Macbeth, um, wondering if all great Neptune's ocean can wash this blood, blood clean from my hand. He's asking himself this question, and then he answers his own question. No, in, in my, the ocean won't wash the blood off of my hand. In fact, the opposite will happen. No, this my hand will rather the multitudinous seas incarnadine. Incarnadine is a word that he makes up from a Latin root, from his inventory of knowing Latin, uh, it's, it's a word that you probably don't know. In fact, he knows you don't knew it, know it because he just made up that word. And in fact, he glosses it in the play itself. It, incarnadine means to turn something red. You can see that root carne there or flesh. Uh, it, it, that he's, he's taken this Latinate word that he's invented and then he's told you what it means in the very next line. But he's created, he's invented something from his inventory. And if you look up the word incarnadine in the Oxford English Dictionary, you'll see that Shakespeare's credited with inventing that word. And it's a word he only uses once in his whole career. He never uses that word um, again. In the 12th chapter, I look at the sonnet form as a, as a productive form of constraint. It's a very rigid form. It has only 14 lines, but millions of sonnets have been written in all global languages and people have used it as a vehicle for all kinds of creativity. So the wonderful ways in which having a constraint can actually induce creativity. In the penultimate chapter, I, I do kind of what I've been doing with you here right now is talking about the, the practice of making and how making applies to everything from a physical object to uh, a computer program to an eloquent speech. And then I conclude the book with the chapter on freedom, the premise being not that freedom means you can do whatever you want, but rather that freedom is working through and inheriting and making your own an intellectual tradition and then producing things in conversation with that tradition. So I end the book with this wonderful essay by James Baldwin titled, it's a great title. The title is Why I Stopped Hating Shakespeare. And Baldwin brilliantly entices you with that title to question, wait, why would, why would someone hate Shakespeare in the first place? And then why would they stop hating Shakespeare? What would, what would make them change their relationship to Shakespeare, which for Baldwin really is emblematic of inheriting the li European literary tradition in general. Um, and the breakthrough that he has where he starts to think of Shakespeare as a peer and as, as someone that belongs to him as much as Shakespeare belongs to all of us and, uh, and not someone that uh, is alien to any of us, but is, is part of our common cultural heritage. So with that quick whirlwind tour of those 14 brief, brief chapters, I think I will pause and ask Taryn if she wants to open it up for questions here. Sure, Does, there's been a, a lively chat of comments about things that you have said. Yeah, I'm happy to elaborate on, on everything. I just wanted to kind of give a, a brief, brief overview of the, of the arc of the book here. No, it's, it's been great. And uh, 
I have put the link to buy the book or to borrow the book from Mechanics Institute in the chat. And I just want to reassure everyone that I will send you an email um, Monday with the link again in case you change your mind. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments that you would like me to pose to Scott? If you do, go ahead and put that in the chat. Everyone's stunned by what you uh, what you talked about so far. I mean, the book, the 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 chapters are. Let me let me let me emphasize that the chapters are meant to be kind of springboards for thought. They're not really meant to either prescribe how we should think, or I certainly don't know how Shakespeare thought, but I do know the ways in which that generation of writers came to be interesting writers came to have great facility with language, which is not different from thinking that the in, in their era, rhetoric itself was considered the kind of fabric of thought like you it wasn't rhetoric wasn't something separate from your thought, but rhetoric truly was the kind of infrastructure or scaffolding or material that gave you the basis for further inquiry. So um, I don't know what the equivalent today would be it would be something like almost like the way we think of DNA today as being like the infrastructure for life. Um, rhetoric was the fabric of thought and it was, and if if you think that being a human being that interacts with other people and speaks to other people is an important thing to do, then practicing how to, how to think and how to speak and how to write better makes sense. And that almost the entire educational system was devoted to, to that. Um. Yes, and back, there is a question here about that. Um, Michelle asks, what kind of education did Shakespeare receive? So it, it was in Latin and that's, that's if you, once you say that, you, it's fascinating because you know, he didn't have classes in English. He wasn't being taught in English. He went through that double translation process, but it was, it was mainly a school system that was developed to give uh, boys, um, girls were excluded unless you were an aristocrat and you could afford a private tutor to give boys fluency in Latin, either for going into the church or being advisors at court or um, dealing with other circumstances where you would need Latin. Um, but as a byproduct of that, there were all kinds of, uh, you were exposed to great models of writers and you were exposed to all kinds of strategies for turning language to your advantage. So there's lots of things about that schooling system that we wouldn't want to repeat. It was it was brutal. It was tender 12 hours a day. It was often five and a half, six days a week um, with few few breaks built into that calendar. But it, it did give an extraordinary verbal fluency and, and practice in thinking your way into other other minds, as it were. Uh, yeah, I'm feeling like my uh, K through 12 was lacking. <laughs> I mean, there were there were other subjects, you know, logic was involved at some stages and dialectic and some mathematics, not not laboratory science the way we think of it today, but but really a a, a series of 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 uh, practices designed to give you almost native fluency in this other language and certainly in in writing it, but also in speaking it and performing it. They would perform plays that they would compose for each other or they would perform classical plays. So um, and 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 practice in improvisation as well in speaking extempore. There is a comment here related to this by Justin. He says, there seems to be a contradiction with the notion Shakespeare knew little Latin and less Greek. Could you please let us know how you researched his possible educational background since his early life has very little documentation? So that Justin's picking up on the famous um, dis by Shakespeare's contemporary Ben Johnson um, when Johnson writes, a, a very ambivalent uh, elegy for Shakespeare that prefaces the posthumous collected works in 1623 of the first folio. Johnson says, even though you had um, small Latin and less Greek, you were still a good writer. Now that is a, that's a, um, that's Johnson saying, I have a lot of Latin and Greek. I worked really hard to be fluent in Latin and Greek. But I, I as I like to point out to my students, uh, and this is no, no diss to my, colleagues here at Rhodes in the classics department, 
those schoolboys who had small Latin and less Greek probably had better Latin than most professional scholars of Latin today um, after having, frankly, having it beaten into them for a decade. Um, and you can, uh, th so that's that's a complicated statement by Johnson and um, you have to kind of know about Ben Johnson and and what his, his kind of competitive relationship is to Shakespeare in order to put that into context. Um, he, it's partly a, a way to say, I'm a very classically um, learned author and you weren't, but it's, it's slight, it's relative in terms of what, what counts for being fluent in Latin and fluent in, in Greek. Classic schoolyard taunt. I'm smarter than you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, backing up a little bit, Jennifer has a question about were there further techniques to use inventory for invention? In, I mean, the, the main, the main, so the inventory is the, in, in classical rhetoric, it's the first of five stages of making a speech. But I, I think it's intriguing just to, to stop with that insight that the, the premise of inventory is that you know a bunch of stuff before you even begin to make a speech. Um, it's not that you sit down with a blank piece of paper and go, okay, how can I make something up? But rather you are widely read in, you know, the broad sense of being educated and liberally, liberally educated, and then also deeply read in a particular field that then allows you to make that first stage of what's the inventory? What can I select from the stuff that I know or the rhetorical moves I can, I can make? So that, again, that was formulated, you know, more than a thousand years before uh, Shakespeare's schooling. But the premise was that you, you don't begin any process of inventing something from nothing. You, you need a full and broad and deep education. And again, I, you can, if you look at interviews with inventors, uh, they will often say, you know, I did not come up with this on my own. It was the synthesis of other inventors and other uh, scientists insights that led me to this, this particular breakthrough. Um, okay. Wow. Suddenly there's a ton of questions. <laughs> Must have said something offensive. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Rick asks, did you, address, he joined a little bit late. Did you address the need for distinguishing Shakespeare's mind and opinions from those of his characters? How much of Shakespeare was in, the man was in his, was in his writing? I guess he's asking. Yeah, you know, I'm, I, I say early on in the book that I'm reluctant to attribute uh, personal opinions to any particular character. I mean, partly the genius of being a playwright is being able to project yourself into lots of different kinds of subject positions. And another practice that would have been done in, in the 16th century classroom was something called um, ethopoeia or the, or the making of character. So for example, um, so here you are a little, 10 year old schoolboy in a rural school, in a rural English school. And I tell you, why don't you imagine yourself in the position of a widow of a slain Trojan warrior? And what would that feel like to speak from that position? So it's a, you know, it's a different gender, it's a different nation, it's a different era, it's a different age, but it is trying to stretch your imagination into a different, um, subject position. So, you know, that in a funny way, that kind of exercise and a lot of these exercises were indirectly great preparation for being dramatists. You know, they didn't, creative writing didn't exist until the early 20th century as a, as a discipline, but this was like great training in creative writing was imagining yourself into other subject positions. So, you know, famously John Keats in the early 19th century says that one of the things that was great about Shakespeare was his almost ability to evacuate himself and project himself into other other voices and other other minds and other characters. So I don't, I don't think it's it's productive or I'm not, it's something I worry about, about trying to isolate like does Shakespeare think X or does Shakespeare think Y, but rather I'm trying to step back to kind of the practices that you can see at play working their way out in, in the works as well as uh, how that emerged from the um, pedagogical habits and practices that that he would have experienced growing up. 
do you, th this sounds to me like something that our writers would really dig <laughs> knowing more about. Do you have any sources or any, does, it, does a chapter of your book cover that topic? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the book is very hasty in the sense that I don't really touch on anything in depth or in detail, but every time I'm making an observation like this, I do have a suggestion for further reading. So Great. there are notes in the book that say, if you're, if you're interested in Ethopuya, look at Lynn Enterline's book on Shakespeare's schoolroom, or if you're interested on the, the 14 step uh, process of writing exercises that are called the pro gymnas mata, here's, here's a book on that with a modern day analog and often there'll be a link to an online resource too. So Perfect. The, the, my book is like a sampler, I guess I would say, and it's, 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 it gives a lot of leads for other, other paths to go. And it, it incorporates a ton of quotations from other, other voices and other writers as a, as a sampler of, of drawing together a, a wide range of, of thinkers and artists and creators. Perfect. Um, Bobby has a has a question that I think is uh, kind of similar to what we're talking about here, or applicable. Since Shakespeare's work is meant to be performed, not just read, how important do you think it is that the actors understand this concept when playing their part? So, uh, so I I think I, I don't like the opposition between performed and read. I think those are mutually wonderfully reinforcing activities. Um, so I, I have heard like directors sometimes have a kind of antagonistic relationship to Shakespeare teachers and say something like Shakespeare's not meant to be read, but performed, but there's no way you can perform it without first reading it. And in fact, actors are incredibly sophisticated about their reading and about their thinking their way into why those lines are constructed that way and, and bringing to bear their, their knowledge of the words and their knowledge of the verse. So I, again, I don't, I don't think of those as an either or choice. And in fact, we, uh, we've learned a great deal in the last couple of decades of research about how, how Shakespeare's works were read um, and how it, it looks like it looks likely that in the last half of his career, he was increasingly self-conscious about how they appeared on the page. So it, there's a great book by a, a scholar named Lucas Ern called um, uh, Shakespeare as a Poet Playwright. Uh, Shakespeare is a literary dramatist, which is meant to capture that sense of someone who both cares about how they're read on the page and how they're performed on the stage. You know, in terms of my own experience and my own teaching, I, I love having students read the plays closely and I love have, having them attend the plays and those things are both enriching for uh, for for the other. So reading helps understand performance better. Performance helps you understand reading better. Recitation memorization helps you understand the reading better too. So um, it's not only that they were meant to be performed. They also had a complex life as things that were intended to be read. Um, there's a couple of questions here that kind of that relate to each other. Um, Sharon and Robert. You had the same question, basically, but how how much do you think Shakespeare was influenced or did he steal from other writers that were contemporaries of his? How much of an influence did his sphere have on his work? Oh, I, um, amazing influence, as all writers are influenced by what they read, both of their predecessors and their peers. So, um, it, in fact, one of the great I think in, enriching pleasures of engaging with any writer is thinking your way into their library or their their archive. And um, you know, I have a colleague who's teaching a seminar on on Toni Morrison and William Faulkner right now. And you know, Morrison wrote her graduate thesis on Faulkner and Wolf. And it's it's it doesn't take away from Mo Morrison's achievement to think about how she engaged and rewrote and took her own version of Faulkner in in new directions. And likewise, it doesn't take away from any artist's achievement to to think about how they're in dialogue with their predecessors and with their peers. So, you know, there, we have tons of examples of Shakespeare learning things from classical sources and transforming them in his works. And then also ways in which he learned and competed with his contemporaries. So probably the major example that is often brought up is his relationship to his exact contemporary, Christopher Marlowe, who's born the same year that he is, arrives in 
London slightly earlier than Shakespeare does and has a great breakout success with the kind of first blockbuster of the London professional stage uh, with the Tamburlaine plays. Kind of like the, imagine that if you're the same age as George Lucas or Steven Spielberg and you're an aspiring filmmaker and they've already made Jaws and Star Wars and it's 1980 and you're, you're just trying to break into the movies. How intimidating that must have been to have an exact contemporary doing what you want to do really well and very successfully. So we've got great examples of Shakespeare in a, a, a brilliantly um, kind of both complementary and combative dialogue with, with Marlowe across his career, even after Marlowe's, Marlowe's death. Yeah, I wish I had a relationship with someone like that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think. <laughs> um, Find someone who looks at you like like Shakespeare looks at Marlowe or something like that. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Wayne has a question that is so deep that I'm going to just read it out loud uh, verbatim. Um, how did thinkers then separate the expressive power of a language from the logical or empirical power? So I, I don't tend to think of those things as separate, um, at least in my experience as a teacher, I, I tend to go with the old saw that you don't often know what you want to say until you've tried to say it, and then you try to say it better, and then you refine your thought further, and then you articulate it even, even better. So kind of in the Erasmian spirit of taking an everyday thought and trying to find better ways to say it. I, I, don't, I don't think that those things are as distinct as they might appear on the surface. Obviously, you know, you can uh, teach logic separately from teaching writing, but, but we, you know, language is such a, uh, again, the kind of fabric of our thought that it's, it's hard to disentangle those, I think. Um, you, you can refine them separately, but they are, they are deeply interwoven. And then um, this is kind of a burning question. Helen wonders, I'm sure we're all thinking this. What is your stance on Shakespeare being Edward de Vere? <laughs> uh, I'm, I, I, you put me in an impossible position because if, you, <laughs> if I say that uh, there's, there's no way I can answer that correctly, right? Because I'm part of the conspiracy of professors that are, are trying to suppress that and deny the the alternative authorship conspiracy so no matter what i say i'm going to be disappointing to anyone who who wants to hear me um come down on one side or another for that but that but uh and this will if anyone is a devere fan they won't like hearing this either but um i think james shapiro's work on contested will is a, is a very he helpful way to think your think into the question of when did those conspiracy alternative authorship ideas first come to be proposed and why were so many of them made by Americans in the 19th century and what was going on with the idea of authorship that had changed in the 19th century that would lead you to presume in a kind of elitist way that someone that was a good writer had to be part of the aristocracy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's discounting the sophistication of that uh, Latin rhetorical education. And I think it is also discounting that that approach is discounting the incredibly dynamic environment of the professional theater, which was um, collaborative and competitive and led to some extraordinary production throughout the 1590s and the early, early 1600s. So the, you know, um, but the, but it, it, like many conspiracy theories, no matter what you say, you won't dissuade someone who's already persuaded of it. If you, if you're interested in learning about the history of how and why those theories began to be proposed, um, the James Shapiro book "Contested Will" is I, something I recommend. But again, that's something a book that's despised by those who believe those conspiracies. You have to admit it has a great title, though. It does have a great title. That has a great title, and you know what. Um, you know what's what what's a separate kind of motivation for wanting to believe that things are not as they seem in general or wanting to kind of find your way behind what you think is an uh an overinflated genius um 
uh, I don't know. I remember. Well, I, I think I think there are lots of lots of reasons why that's appealing as as a way to think um, about about an author. It just does not align with um, anything that we know about his biographical record and and the way theater worked at that period. Um, okay. Uh, now, a lot of people had some questions that kind of dance around what I'm going to ask you. How did you get into, how did you start, what interests you about Shakespeare? How did you, how did you write this book? Like what, what motivated it all? So I'm, I've always been in, interested in the long history of rhetoric, in the long history of the, the practice of teaching language and teaching composition. And um, that's part of what drew me to the historical period of 1500 to 1700 in the first place was uh, some of these educational practices that were refined and, and were articulated in handbooks to, to better writing and to better speaking. And um, I think it's a fascinating and rich period in part because it's looking back to earlier eras and trying to recuperate uh, earlier educational practices for new nations that are emerging or new nation states that are emerging and, um, and continues to be intriguing for us to this day, 400 plus years later. So, you know, that's the big answer is that that's intriguing to me about the, the era in general. And then, um, you know, Shakespeare's career in particular intersects with that. And I think there's some marvelous things that you can learn the more you learn about that rhetorical tradition. Um, the, book, the book emerged out of, I think, two converging strands. One being, uh, I was reading a lot of great work about these, um, intellectual habits and practices from the 16th century and, and what professional theater was like in the late 16th century at the same time that my own kids were going through various stages of schooling and were feeling frustrated about some of the educational reforms that they were encountering. So, in, you know, I, on the one hand, I had kind of my, my professional hat on of, of paying attention to work in my field from 400 years ago, and then also some frustration about what I'd seen in education in, in my kids' schooling. Not that they had uh, teachers that weren't devoted and, and incredibly um, caring and, and, uh, and loving teachers, but that the system and the system of a series of reforms over the last couple of decades had, had taken away some of the things that I think are enduring and valuable about education. So the book really came together as when I was trying to figure out what was frustrating about this and what was still valuable and viable about, about these historical practices and how, how they can remain valuable to us today. Yeah, and what do you think about new math or whatever <laughs> they call it? <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> um, yes, um, you know, I just want to uh, reassure some of the people in the chat space that I will include a not the full chat transcript because there's some things that maybe aren't super important in there, like hellos and that sort of thing. But usually I include an edited version of the chat um, in my email to everyone uh, with links to the book and um, stuff like that. So look in your inbox on Monday or Tuesday if um, it's a especially busy Monday. Um, all right, does anyone have any last questions for Scott before we uh, thank him profusely? Oh, here we go. Justin asks, he's curious where Shakespeare might have developed the three-dimensionality of self-overhearing. The three-dimensionality of self-overhearing. Um, I don't know, I mean, I think, I. I like to think of Shakespeare as a, a certain kind of artist that had a sponge-like capability of absorbing things around him. Um, there's a great, if you've ever seen the kind of movie uh, biopic documentary, uh, 32 short films about Glenn Gould, there's a, a, about the Canadian pianist. There's a great scene where he's in a, uh, I think it's a coffee shop or some public venue, and he's kind of listening to bits of conversation and almost orchestrating them in his head as he's as he's drawing them together. That to me seems very Shakespearean. It's also what I associate with a creator like Orson Welles, um, mm -hmm. someone who's able to pick up on other voices and and absorb them and synthesize them into a, a kind of dynamic production. Um, I don't know if that is 
I don't know how trainable that is. I do think that learning how to listen to other writers is something that trains you how to attend to voice and how to pick up on other other voices and eventually again imitate them and incorporate them into your own voice but three-dimensionality i don't know um what justin's getting at there i think that's a very abstract thing and i don't know if that is as teachable in the same way um okay and then i just got a note from manes who asks um is are you specialized I, do you specialize in poetry of Shakespeare as well, or mainly are you interested in how he thinks? Uh, again, I don't think that those are separate things. I think I think he thinks through the words, and the words think um, help me think when I when I struggle with them and when I dig into them and when I piece them apart in the classroom. So absolutely, I love the poetry, and and we're we're reading the sonnets in my classes right now as we speak. So um, I think I think they're endlessly rewarding to return to. Um, well, I want to thank you so much for this uh, uh, discussion of your book. And the more that you talk, the more I think, oh, I've got to remember to look for that topic in the book itself. Um, so I think all of our minds are busily clicking through what you've just Excellent. said. <laughs> um, and yes, the chat is lit up with thanks uh and um so i hope i hope you sell a few books we do have the book in our library so um if you are a mechanics member rush out now and check it out before i grab it i'm just kidding i did <laughs> i did flip through it when i bought it <laughs> so you can have it um but uh yeah i want to thank you so much for reaching out to me because you you did you you uh emailed me months ago and i'm so glad that we were able to uh, host you I'm glad. I'm really glad. Thank you very much, Taryn. It's nice to talk to you. Likewise. Um, I hope you have a great rest of the day and a great school year. And, uh, and I think we all look forward to reading the book. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend and look out for my email on Monday. <laughs> Thanks so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>